Well, good morning, and welcome back to church. Will you please stand and worship with us? In the presence of my enemies. 
Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song in jesus we And you make a 
God, what a what a privilege. Lord, with all of the things that are happening in countries in the Middle East or North Korea or Africa or other countries, God, that are just persecuting Christians for even mentioning your name, for even affiliating with someone who mentioned your name. God, we get to come in this place every Sunday or every day of the week that we want to, God. And we get to declare with our brothers and sisters around us that we love you. It's not just a uh, some words that we sing. It's not just some, some lyrics on a projector. God, it's our heart crying out that we love you. In this moment, we thank you, God, for being in a place where we can do that. For being in a country where we can say that without worrying about someone 
coming in and killing all of us. So God, as we reflect on these things, as we thank you for these things, would you speak to us in this time today? It's in your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Will you please turn to those who are next to you and welcome them into this place today? Welcome, I'm Pastor Bob. Good to, good to have you here this morning. Uh, I just want to give you a couple announcements right off the bat here. So we have uh, the Pray is One on September 11th, which I think is just a, uh, a wonderful date. They're actually going from uh, to different churches in the area every day for 30 days. And we've been given uh, 9-11, which is a Saturday, to gather for prayer. So I want to invite you to that. I think that could be a significant event for us. So mark your calendar, September 11th, which is a Saturday night, 6.30 to 7.30. Also, um, we're starting up sign-ups for our next class uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, Mike Cordetti is going to be teaching a class called 30, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. And it was funny that uh, I was talking to Mike and um, we were looking at different subjects to, to, to lead the, for the next study. And someone just before, the day before, said to me, boy, I would love a study where I could just have somebody explain to me how to understand the Bible. And Mike says, I, have, I know this study called Understanding the Bible. I said, okay, that sounds like the one we should do. So that one's, uh, there's a sign-up sheet for these things. Everything's on the welcome desk. And Crystal will m monitor all of that, right, Crystal? Also, um, Franklin Graham and the Newsboys are coming to Joliet Speedway. That's on September 19th, which is a Sunday. Uh, sign up sheet for that. They're just trying to coordinate if any wants, anyone wants to go, we, to go together. We are gearing up for a connection class September 19th. That'll start at 5 o'clock if you're interested in membership or baptism. A sign up sheet for that as well. Some of you have asked me about that. The Encounter Tour with Lisa Turkhurst, uh, Tuesday, November 9th. They're ahead of that game. Uh, interested in going as a group, ladies? Go to the welcome desk, and Crystal will get you signed up and tell you where to go for tickets. Did I do good, Crystal? I did good. Okay. Next week, uh, actually, Kwame's going to come. I don't know if you've met Kwame. He's at home. He's coming back from school. He's going to be doing our announcements, so people are rejoicing that I'm not doing that anymore. But anyway, we're looking forward to that. He, you know, he's excited about doing <laughs> comments. You know, sinners, what happens? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm looking forward to Kwame coming back. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we gather in your name, uh, and we thank you that we can be called the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, local, invisible, uh, an army of people, a community of people who love you, who want to serve you, <clears throat> who come to worship you. Uh, Lord, thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for saying to us, you belong to me. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives with us and in us. Thank you for fellow believers who we can love and serve. And thank you for the world that needs to know about you, that you've sent us to reach. Lord, in so many ways, you've called this group, this body, this church together, and you've filled it with yourself, and we thank you for that. We pray for our world, we're especially mindful of Afghanistan this morning and for the chaos occurring there. And I want to lift up um, Austin Smith 
who's Gina's, uh, Tackerberry's husband, who is uh, in Cabal at, at the airport as one of the Marines that's, that's working there. I pray for him. I pray for, for Jenna and her family as they, as they lift up uh, Austin. Lord, I pray that you would protect him and, and the fellow soldiers and the Afghans who are struggling there uh, in, the, in this chaos. Lord, I, I pray that you would be powerful there. Lord, lead us now into worship. Help us to worship you through our giving, our listening, our applying your word to life today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've been working our way through the letter of James, written to the early church about how to live undeniably Christian lives in this world. James was very concerned that people not only know what they believe, but that they live it out in their daily lives. And that's not just because, uh, you know, we feel that's important or because we think it's important for our family and friends, but because living for Jesus in this world is really, really important to God. It's really important to God that you live out your faith. And it, it matters so much to God that someday, at the moment of our deaths, we will be standing before the Lord, and He will judge us for how well we lived our lives for Him. Did you know that? Not every, I don't think every Christian really knows that. That never really sunk into me uh, as I grew up in the church my whole life. And I learned all about God and, and who he was. But I don't think I got that piece about, hey, it really, really matters to God how you live your life, Bob. I finally got it in my 20s, you know. But uh, it really, really matters to God so much so that uh, at the end of this life, we are going to be judged for how well we actually did that. It's actually the first thing the Lord wants to address us about when we arrive in heaven. And this judgment's not to be confused with a condemnation judgment. Uh, Christians are not condemned. The Bible is pretty specific about that. Heaven is assured to every believer. This judgment is about what our rewards will be for the way that we lived our lives. And in the last chapter, um, the first section, which is usually the section that preachers skip, it's, it's, it's like, what? Where, where does this fit? And then it goes to patience, how patient we need to be in suffering, and then it goes to prayer, which is usually the one we pick, you know, that we ought to be in prayer. But this first section is often skipped, so I didn't skip it. The uh, first six verses focus on, really the whole chapter focuses on between now and that last day, but uh, the context, that's the context. Nobody knows, you know, when you're going to die. Nobody, nobody knows the exact moment. Nobody knows the day that Jesus might return. But someday we will be standing before Jesus, and that could be yet today. 
And James, again, is, a, is attempting to get us to appreciate how important it is for us to live for Jesus Christ in the details of our lives. On the street level, as Christians at work, in our homes, in our relationships, in our dealings, attitudes, lifestyles, because, and he's going to get to this in this first section, because there's actually a uh, competitor to your living for Jesus. And you might very well live for this competitor or something else during your lifetime, and then on that day you arrive in heaven, things will not go so well for you in terms of rewards. So there are about 40 separate references in the New Testament that talk about eternal rewards, but one that really focuses our attention on this meeting, this appointment that we're going to have when we die and when we arrive in heaven, is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. So I want to look at that. Pretty, pretty clear. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Is that pretty clear? That's like really clear. It describes a meeting that we Christians will have with the Lord right after we die. And it is interesting to think that the most important appointment that we have to keep is the appointment we will have after we die, not Appointments that we have while we're alive. Bill Johnson. Maybe you know Bill. He's somebody known to many of us. He's part of the Youth for Christ board for years and years. He's attended here on and off over the years. Shirley McGuire, who attended here for years. Teresa Miller's sister. Um, Pastor Miller's wife's sisters. Stephanie Payne's dad. They all had that meeting this past week. They all died. Some of them just totally unexpectedly. You and I will have this meeting too. At the moment of our death, we will find ourselves standing before Jesus, who Paul says is sitting on a throne. Some of this is very symbolic. Paul calls it the judgment seat of Christ. The Greek word judgment seat is bima. It's the Roman, uh, the, the Roman governor sat on the bima in the public court and announced decisions for all to hear. I saw those when I was, when I was in Greece. The word translated appear here means to appear in such a way that everything is revealed. In that moment, your whole life as a Christian will appear. You and the Lord will see it all in that moment, and there will actually be an audience in this meeting, according to Luke 12, 8 and Revelation 3, 5. God the Father will be there watching. There will be a host of angels there also. Jesus on the throne will be leading the meeting. Jesus on the throne will hear from our lives, and he will decide what reward we will receive based on the way that we've lived our lives, in the details, which will appear on the big screen in heaven. So it's kind of a big deal. The Lord talks about, uh, or the Bible talks about the Lord giving out rewards, crowns, they're often called, at this meeting. This is also symbolic of some of the excellent ways that people have lived that Jesus wants to highlight at this meeting. My mom used to say uh, that her crown would be filled with jewels for having to raise uh, six kids that she had in seven years. You know, that's a lot of kids to deal with in the home. I think Jesus will be honoring Christian moms. The Bible says there will be a crown of life. James 1.12, given to those who have persevered under trials. There is the crown of righteousness given to those who have longed for the, Lord, the, the Lord's return, 2 Timothy 4.8. And there is the crown of glory 
that the Lord gives to those who have loved and shepherded his flock well. 1 Peter 5.4. I hope I get that crown. The reality of this meeting and the reward's purpose sometimes scares people, Christians. And, I, and this letter, this, what we're going to read here, is not being read to the non-Christian population. It's being read to the church. It shouldn't scare you, church, this meeting. No Christian will be totally excluded from the rewards. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Some rewards will be like hay and straw, and others will be, you know, there will be different levels of, of rewards. What this meeting and the rewards associated uh, should do is to motivate us to live for Jesus every day, to strive to please Him in all that we do, knowing for sure that one day we will stand before the Lord. And for that reason, James wants us to realize, because that's going to happen, that we may want to please the Lord in all that we do starting today. I think that's why he's reading it to the, I mean, he's making that point to the church, getting our attention. Like today might really matter. And it, and it matters how you actually spend your life. Author Jack Deere, who was also a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, writes, Jesus taught us about rewards not to intimidate us, but to help us yearn to please him. As long as there is breath in us, there is still time to please him, still enough time to live in a way that allows him to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So now that everyone here knows about the message of James, because we've talked about it for this is, I think this is the fifth week now that we're supposed to live our lives for Jesus. Uh, James wants us to know now in perspective between today and when we stand before Jesus that we will face a competitor in this life to living for Jesus, a, a fierce competitor, a primary competitor. Who would you live your life for if not Jesus? This is the background for what James is going to talk about. And he, James is warning us and he's, he's telling us to watch out for this particular competitor to living for Jesus. Jesus' competitor is wealth, James says. It's wealth. And Jesus would agree. His brother, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, which I believe is in the background of this entire letter. Jesus says that people will face the choice between two masters. They'll live for one or they'll live for the other. Only one will win the battle for our time, our focus, our energies, our priorities. Jesus says it will be either God or money. We will live our lives for one or the other. Luke 16, 13. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So mark this down, James says, the competitor for your living for Jesus, church, Christians, is wealth. It's the greatest competitor that we will face in the day-to-day, -day, what, what we live for. And he's writing this to the church, to believers. He wants us to know the competition we face. Now, here is what James knows, and we should know. We can believe all sorts of things as Christians. We can even know that at the moment we die, which could be at any moment for any one of us, that we will be suddenly standing before the Lord in this, this grand meeting with God the Father and a host of angels. And the subject of the meeting will be, how did we live our lives for Jesus? In the details. And that will all appear before the big screen. We can know that. And you know that now. 
you're headed for that meeting, and it won't be very long. These are the last days, right? Time is short. We can know all of that and still be tempted to live our lives for something else, for someone else, for something in particular, and that's wealth. Isn't that the truth? That's why James so strongly condemns not people with money, but lots of believers in the, because lots of believers in the Bible had money. Lots of believers did. And they lived their lives for the Lord with money. But he condemns Christian people who know the truth about living for the Lord, but live for money and the rewards it gives. And James says, you don't want to spend your life that way. If you do, it won't go well in that meeting. Money is not something we should live for. Not just because, you know, money is a competitor in that sense. Because living for money affects the way you live. The choices you make. The kinds of things that you're willing to do. Things that are absolutely contrary or wicked to the choices and things you would do if you were living for the Lord. So that's James' opening context in chapter 5. People who live for money and the rewards it brings make wicked choices and do wicked things that the Lord would never approve of or reward, but money would. So be careful, Christians, about that competitor, wealth. It'll steal your life away if you let it. So James opens chapter 5 with a scathing rebuke of people who live for money and its rewards instead of living for the Lord and the rewards he brings. That's the context. You ready for the, the word now from James? James chapter 5, verse 1. This is to the church. Some people think this is so scathing that it must not be to the church. It must be to people who are unbelievers. But this is actually to the church. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now, what if I preached that? I am going to preach that. Wow. James is not talking about everybody who has money. He's talking about people who live for money and the rewards it brings and the choices and the decisions that that master Wicked choices, wicked decisions that people who, who, who live for money will make. Now, what are some of those? Let's look at them. James says, people who live for money are hoarding wealth. They're hoarding wealth. They never, the Lord would never approve of hoarding wealth. Working and striving to pile it up higher and higher and higher. To fill the banks and to fill your mattresses and to fill whatever it is you fill. Just so you have more of it. And you could stand back and look at it. And you could wonder and get excited about the different amounts that you have in different accounts and, and how it's growing. The Lord would never have you do that. Hoard wealth. Verse 2, your 
wealth, he says, is rotted. The moss have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. You know time is short, yet you still hoard wealth. I saw a documentary on drug lords, and they had one who had so much money uh, they they blur their faces, you know. It's really really interesting, but they were in his one of his offices or where he was operating, and he had money just stacked, stacks and stacks and stacks, and he was laughing and talking about it. And then he took hundred dollar bills and he lit his fireplace with hundred dollar bills. He just had so much money and he just hoarded resources like that. And 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 money would approve of you doing that, but the Lord never would. James says uh, it's like hoarding more food than you can possibly eat. You have rotten food in your refrigerator. You've got so much food in your refrigerator that you just throw away everything that just rots over time because you have more food than you can eat. And you have so much clothes, James says, that it still has a tag on it hanging in, the, in, the, in your closet, but the moths have already eaten it, sat there for so long. Who needs that many clothes? The Lord would never have us Manage things like that. Your money has sat for so long that it's corroded and it's non-negotiable. The Lord would never have you live and manage money like that. He would have you put it to good use. He would have you invest it in kingdom building enterprises. He would have you use it to bless the world, to make a difference with money in this world. And Jesus had all kinds of parables about that. You know, the parable of the talents, for example. Not to squirrel it away. Not to pile it up. That's wicked. The Lord would not have you hoard money. That's not a great way to live. If you die and go to heaven and stand in the meeting and the only thing you have to say is, look at the pile. Look at the piles of money that I have. Things will not go well for you. The Lord would not have you hoard wealth. Money would, but not the Lord. Number two, he says, the Lord would never have you take advantage of people. He'd never approve of taking advantage of people, especially people that are easy to take advantage of, just to line our pockets with a little more money. But money would. The Lord never would, but money would. Verse four, look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. When you live for money and you have people who depend on you to pay them to live and you take advantage of them. That's what James is saying. People that mow your lawn, groundskeepers. You you look to short, you have lots of money. But you look to shortchange them just to line your pockets with just a little more money. He said, that's a really wicked way to live. The Lord would never approve of such a thing. But money would. Money would have you do whatever you could to keep as much for yourself and pay as little as possible. The Lord would never have you do that. Generosity is the principle that we are to live by. The Lord would have you pay people generously who depend upon you, more than they deserve to be paid. The Lord would have you look for ways to bless them. They should be glad to work for you to mow your lawn. Because they say, I'll mow your lawn. I have these little kids that knock on my door. I'll mow your lawn for $5, and when they're done, you give them 10 That's what we do. That's what Christians do. Because we are trying to impact people with generosity. Money would never have you do that. He'd say, I'll mow it for five, and you say, can we negotiate? Would you do it for 250? And the little kid says, well, okay. The Lord is not happy with that. In fact, he says, the harvester's cries have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. The Lord, hearing cries of those being taken unfair advantage of, is a very fearful matter if you're the cause. 
I don't have time to develop this from Scripture today. But if you study the prophets <laughs> all the way through, if you are taking advantage unfairly of people who don't have any recourse, it's a scary thing to be that person. If the Lord, quote unquote, hears about it. The Lord Almighty is listening. The word there is Lord Sabaoth, His name, the Holy One. If He takes notice of our taking advantage of the weak, someone who depends on you to live, you are in trouble. The Lord would have us bless those who depend on us. Next one. Isn't this fun? Self-indulgence. Money would have you indulge yourself. The Lord never would. Verse 5, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. James is talking about someone who just can't get enough. No matter how much they have, they can't get enough. One more luxury. Something bigger, something better, something faster. Their appetites for more are insatiable. Their money is just driving them for more, to get more and more and more and more. It's never enough. In the Bible, the sin is called dissipation or overindulgence or degeneracy. In 1 Timothy 5, 6, Paul describes such people as dead to the Lord even while they're still alive. They're so dead because they're driven by this. The Lord would never have Christians live like this. James says it's like being a cow that's being fatted up for slaughter. When I'm in South Dakota in the fall, I don't know too much about raising cows, but he always has, a farmer that we, we hunt by, always has a whole pasture full of these yearlings or whatever they are that he's fattening up. And they get them to us. They, they're just born this year in the spring, I think. And by the time they hit the fall, they're really starting to fatten them up because they're about to sell them to slaughter at some point. And, and they're just gobbling down food like crazy the whole time that we're there. But little do they know that they're indulging themselves, but it's going to be a very short-lived way to live. It'll be good for a little while, but not for long. Moderation is the guiding principle for Christian living. We should enjoy the Lord's blessings. The Bible tells us to do that. But we are people who are to steward the Lord's resources under our supervision to meet all of our responsibilities to God and to others and to our own family. That's how Jesus would have us live. Money would have us live very differently. Number four, ruthlessness. The Lord would never approve of our being ruthless, but money would. Two different kinds of masters. Verse six, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. The idea here is that money is such a driving force in a person's life that you are ruthless when it comes to money with people, especially if they get in your way. And you don't even have to know them. They're not really opposing you. They're just collateral damage. Don't get in the way, James is talking about, People who are driven by money to get more of it because they'll mow you over. The Lord would never approve of that life. He would have us walk away from any deal that benefits us but hurts someone who shouldn't be hurt. And again, it's because we exist to bless people. This is the kind of... Life the Lord would have us live. So how's that for a scathing rebuke, a sermon, if you're the church? He's talking to the church. I don't, I don't believe I've ever heard that sermon my whole life. Like, whoa, wait a minute. 
I mean, I might be following money, serving money in my life. I might be some of these things right here. James says, read it to the church. So money is, is a master that might make it very difficult for us to le- live for Jesus between now and when we stand before the throne, between now and the moment we die. We might have served money for a long time and maybe not even realized that we've been serving it and not the Lord. It offers rewards in this life that are very tempting. We could easily choose that life. I believe at some level we're all tempted by this life. Some of us are living this life and need to be warned about it. Christians, living for money, is that a life worth living? Do we want this life to appear on the big screen in heaven at our meeting with Jesus? Living for Jesus, on the other hand, is a life worth living. Let's examine that for a few minutes. Jesus would have us live a different life. A life lived for him. He doesn't want us to hoard wealth, but to invest it in the kingdom building purposes. He doesn't want us to take advantage of people. He wants us to bless others by being overly generous. He doesn't want us to indulge ourselves in so many luxuries. He wants us to steward his resources to meet all our responsibilities to God and others. And the Lord doesn't want us to be ruthless and to destroy the lives of others. He wants us to be a blessing and to build up those we encounter. So what is this life worth living? It's a life that will cost you money-wise, is pretty clear in the Scripture. If you want to live this life, you probably are going to have less of the things that money can offer. So what makes that life worth, worth living? It's that you have more of what God offers. You will be blessed in ways money will never bless you. This is the pivot now. Jesus said, John 10.10, from the message now, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. I can't preach the entire sermon on the mount today, but I believe James has this message on his mind as he writes this letter. The opening section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is called the Beatitudes. They are declarations of supernatural blessings or rewards for Christians in this world as they live for Him. Here's the blessings, Christians. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great, listen, because great is your reward in heaven. In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I'll share just a little bit here. And I know I'm running out of time. I only got two minutes. I have about a lot more than two minutes. But anyway. What are the blessings? Why is this life worth living, Christian? For Jesus, the master. Instead of for the master, the money. Number one, Jesus promises to supernaturally bless the poor in spirit. And that's us. That's people who live for Jesus and realize how insufficient they are in themselves. And do you ever say, Lord, I can't do it. I don't have enough of what I need to live for you in daily life, at work, in my home, in my marriage, with my friends. Lord, I'm insufficient. Can you trust the Lord for what you need? To live that life there. Because the Lord promises to fill those insufficiencies with his gracious provisions. To give you supernatural power to live for him. Supernatural strength. Supernatural hope. Supernatural help. Supernatural 
abilities to live for Him in every context, in every situation. Money can't do that. He promises, number two, to supernaturally bless those who mourn with comfort. That's us again. People who live for Jesus look to Him when we face losses for comfort. Mourning. Grief is such a difficult part of all of our lives. It's very hard to lose people that we love. Our health. It's hard to lose our friends and our reputations. We all grieve losses. And grieving really hurts. We're talking about real life now. And the Lord promises us supernatural comfort. Money can't give you that. Everyone suffers losses in life. Are you suffering a loss, Christians? A friend of Sherry's sister died yesterday from COVID, living in Panama City, Florida. She was 50 years old. She has a 14-year-old daughter. And the whole church is devastated. I know some of you are grieving relational struggles and losses. Some of you are grieving the loss of your health. If you've been staying current with what's happening in Afghanistan, I talked to one young woman this week who told me she watched how the mom handed the little infant over the razor wire to a Marine reaching over to grabbed the little baby, and she said, watching the TV, she just wept that people have to go through such things in this crazy world we live in. Do you ever grieve the awful things that go on in this world? I do. What is your comfort in life and in death? Do you know? A catechism I grew up on called the Heidelberg Catechism, gives a beautiful answer to that question. And I'd like to read it to you. It's question and answer number one in this catechism. Question, what is your only comfort in life and death? Listen to this answer. That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to what? Live for Him. When you live your life for Jesus and suffer loss, Jesus says, He promises you, Christian, He will give you supernatural comfort. Thirdly, He promises to supernaturally bless the meek. There's eight of them. I'm only going to do four. This is number three. The meek are us. The meek are people who live for Jesus and are okay with not owning everything that the world has to offer. The reason they're okay with it is because God blesses them with a supernatural confidence that someday this will not be the way it is. They don't have to fight for everything to get everything in this life, the meek, because they have a confidence and assurance that this is not the way it's always going to be. They know the promises of the gospel, that someday the whole earth will be your inheritance, Christian. Did you know that? You're going to inherit the whole earth. That's your reward for living for Jesus. The whole earth is yours. Can you imagine this meeting? If the whole earth is your inheritance when you get to be with the Lord someday. I love inheritances. I got one from my grandma. By the time my grandma lived very long, she had a little bit left for all of her grandchildren. And the, and, the, and the little will said, spend it on something you would never buy otherwise. 
And so we bought our little above ground pool that grandma paid for. And my children enjoyed their entire life. Christians, you're going to inherit the earth. You don't have to worry about not having everything in this life. It's okay. You're going to have in the next life. And it's going to be better and more and more fun than what it could be right now. I think about that. I don't think Jesus is being symbolic here. I think he's being literal when he says you're going to inherit the whole earth. I mean, you're going to have stuff you never had. Enjoy stuff you never enjoyed. When I think about it, I'm going to have a brand new rear engine Corvette. There's going to be lots of those in heaven. In fact, I might have a whole mountain, Bob's Mountain Retreat. I don't know. I'm inheriting the whole earth. What else might I enjoy in heaven? Number four, he promises to supernaturally bless those who suffer because they live for him. Last one, we'll get it. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So whatever you suffer from for living for Jesus, Jesus says insults, persecution, lies, whatever, you'll be blessed for that. Great will be your reward in heaven. Now I'm thinking about the reports that I'm hearing of Christians being hunted down and killed in Afghanistan as we speak. In the same way that God granted supernatural courage to the prophets, he is supernaturally providing for those Christians living for him in that awful situation right now. And when anyone who suffers in this life for Jesus dies and goes to heaven, the blessings don't end. Great is your reward in heaven. That's going to be on the big screen. All the ways you suffered some kind of loss because you lived for Jesus in this life that you didn't serve all the things that money had to offer, but you served the Lord and you suffered because of it. This life we live matters to God. It's not just about knowing stuff about God. It's not just about being able to quote the Bible and know everything that's in the Bible. You have to not only be the hearers or the understanders of the Bible, but you have to be the doers of the Bible. These things work together. James is writing to get this point across, and he goes to extremes to try to get us to understand it. It's because God cares about how you live for him. And one day, you're going to be standing before God. It could be today. And there's going to be this meeting that you step into, and it's a meeting with you alone. And Jesus is going to be on the bema, the judgment seat. And God the Father is going to be there, and a host of angels are going to be in the audience. And your life is going to appear on the big screen in heaven, and you're going to see the whole life at the same time. Your whole life. And Jesus will review it, and then he'll reward you for the life that you've lived for him. Are you ready for that meeting? These are the last times. None of us knows. No matter how, how long it is, it's not very long before you'll be in that meeting. It could be today. Live for Jesus in the details. It matters to God that you do. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the message of James and uh, boldness with it, which he speaks this message about living for you in this world. And I pray that as we've heard it as a church, that we would recommit ourselves, even starting today, to live for you in ways we haven't, to your pleasure and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
you stand and sing with us? Just gone through the motions. I'm sorry. When I just sang another song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. Sorry, and I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. Oh, I just want to sit here. caught up in this holy moment never want to leave oh I'm not here to bless it oh, Jesus you don't owe me anything more Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. We sing, I just. Oh, I'm 
caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. No, I'm not here for a blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me. Anything that you can do, I just want you. <clears throat> Make sure you follow up with the sign-up sheets if you're interested in the things we've talked about in the announcements. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and will present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To our one true God, Jesus Christ, be glory and honor, dominion and power, now and forever. Amen. Go and live for Jesus this week.